Hey guys, Jeremy here with Simple Little Life. Today we're going to talk about heat treating stainless steels and the cryogenic treatment of steels. Now, before we get too into this, I'd just like to offer up a couple of caveats. Uh, the first one being that I am not an expert in this stuff, not by any stretch. I've been messing around with stainless steels for over a year now, and then cryogenically treating steels for about seven months. So I'm fairly new to this stuff. I've done a ton of research. I've tried a lot of different things. Some have failed, some have succeeded, but I'm just sharing with you kind of what I've discovered so far. And even every day, like last week, I tried a brand new process, a brand new step to see the differences it makes. So this is by no means a, hey, boom, this is figured out but what I'd like this video to serve as is rather just a broad strokes picture kind of to just show the differences between heat treating high carbon steels and stainless steels hopefully beneficial to a lot of new makers people that have been making knives with the carbon steels and like well what it what does it look like to get into stainless steels that's the kind of the idea the goal behind this video also I'd love to hear you chime in in the comments below let me know what you think if there's things you can add to this conversation that would be awesome I don't really know how to set up this video so we're just gonna kind of start from the basic from the ground up and just kind of move up that way. We're going to take a look at both carbon steels as well as stainless steel. So on this side of the camp here, your right, my left, we've got high carbon steels, things like the 10 series of steels, 01 tool steel, other tooling steels, uh, things that are generally kind of easier to heat treat. You know, most new makers will start off with something in this camp here, kind of work from there, figure that out, and excellent, excellent tools and knives are made with steels here. Let's not ever confuse that, you know, th there's pros and cons to everything, but some fantastic fantastic blades that are going to be really good long lasting knives absolutely all day long in this camp of high carbon steels. And the other side, which is my right, your left, we're going to be talking about some stainless steels, things like 440C, 154CM, CPM 154, ABL, Nitro V, 440C. There's also CPM 3V, CPM 35, VN, whatever, all these steels. A lot of those steels I haven't tried yet. Uh, I've done a lot of work with CPM 154, a little bit of work with 154CM, just starting some 440C, and then quite a bit of Nitro V, and I'm just starting to mess around with some ABL as well. So those are kind of where we're gonna group these things together. So. When we buy our steel, this here is a couple bars of 01 tool steel that I picked up today. Uh, this is uh, precision ground flat stock. And so we're gonna kind of take it from this step here. We're not talking about reusing uh, spring steel or some other steels that you find because there's a lot of other variables. But say if you've got a known steel like this, this is 01 tool steel and this has not been hardened. This is machinable, I can cut this, I can grind this, and it's a really great steel, but if I wanted this to be a knife, I've got to harden it up and I've got to change its structure a bit. So. When you get into this stuff, there's a lot of scientific terminology and everything seems to end with it. You know, there's martensite, uh, austenite, and every type of it. I don't know why. We're not gonna get too crazy on that stuff, but we are gonna use some of these things so we can kind of understand what's going on. And this to me seems to be one of the hardest parts to explain, but we're gonna give it a go. So. We've got our knife, say we've got this steel here and we've shaped the knife out of it, we've ground it, now we need to harden it. Hardening it is a process where you take a steel up to its austenizing temperature. And that is a temperature that's just above critical. Uh, before I had erroneously said in a video that we need to go to its critical temperature, Ultimately, the critical temperature is the temperature of the steel where it won't change its, its, um, its characteristics too much, right? You can go up to that temperature and come back down and you're not gonna really change it. That's the upper critical temperature. Now, to harden the steel, we need to go past that because we don't wanna heat it up, cool it down, and end up with the state that this is in. We need, to, we need to change this. And so we need to get to the austenizing temperature. Now, every steel in this camp here has a different austenizing temperature, but just as a generalization, we're gonna say around 1500 degrees. Again it's plus, it's above, it's above, it's below, but 1500 degrees is kind of the generalized temperature for a lot of these high carbon steels. Now what happens at that temperature, and this is difficult to explain, but the way that I kind of understand it is that this here has carbon in it. It's a high carbon steel. After we harden it, we haven't added or taken away the carbon. We've kind of rearranged it within the structure of the steel. So when you're at the austenite temperature, that carbon, instead of being kind of evenly distributed and diffused within the steel, it's kind of separating itself out. It's kind of pulling away from the other ones. It's kind of grouping together and its personality is kind of being shown. That's kind of what happens at the austenizing temperature. That's the austenite state of a steel. And so the carbons are separated, the little carbides are 
are separated and they're all like this. Now, if we were to just very slowly cool that down, we could turn it back into the state that this is in right now. You know, we could just kind of let those cool down. They'd slowly start to diffuse and mingle in and kind of hide within the rest of the steel. But we don't want that. We want that carbon to be bang prevalent because that's what holds the edge. That's what keeps it hard and sharp. So what we want to do is really quickly cool that. And essentially, we're kind of locking those in position, kind of like a game of freeze tag. You know, it's like, ah, just like that. So that's kind of what we're doing uh, when we're cooling it down. And that's called the Martensite state. It's a rapid cooling from austenite to kind of, to get a hard crystal structure where the carbides are kind of separated and kind of locked in place. Essentially, that is the hardening process. So typically with these steels here, these high carbon steels, you can do that with some type of a liquid quench. Some do better with water, salt brine, oil, Different types of oil work differently for different steels, but that's the basic generalization of how to get a martensite state of a knife. We've heated up our blade, we've kind of gotten all the good stuff out of it, and then we've locked it in place. Now, once we're at that point, it's obviously brittle. It's like glass, right? Glass is super sharp, but it's very brittle. And the tempering process is where we kind of controllably remove some of that martensite state out of the steel. Now, let's jump back over here to the stainless steels. The austenizing temperature of stainless steels is significantly higher than high carbon steels. Around here, we're going to use the ballpark of about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. So we've got 1500 degrees for our high carbon steels, closer to 2000 degrees for our stainless steels. And again, each steel has its own different temperature, different recipes and stuff, but as a generalization, 2000 degrees. Now, one thing that happens at 2000 degrees that we do not experience as much or even at all at 1500 degrees is a process called decarburization. And essentially what that is, is where the oxygen actually eats away at the carbon in the steel. So we've got this thing, we're going up to 2000 degrees and a lot of these steels need to be held there for like 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. Some people say an hour, but 20 to 30 minutes, if there's oxygen all around that steel, it's going to start eating away the carbon content. Now, one way to mitigate this, and it's probably the most common with uh, small scale knife makers, is to create a inert environment. And we do that by using a stainless steel tool making foil, a uh, tool wrap foil, and we create like a little envelope, a little pouch to put the knife into. Uh, I'll show you. So this here is 309 stainless steel foil wrap. And this stuff is expensive. Uh, 20 inches wide, 20 feet long is $150 Canadian. Very expensive. This is not just aluminum foil, uh, but we take this stuff and we create a little envelope. And you do that by folding over the corners. Uh, I double fold mine, hammering them down, crimping those edges. And the goal is to create an airtight pouch that, that will keep fresh oxygen out as your knife is sitting away, austenizing at its austenizing temperature. Now, at this point, a lot of guys will actually put in some type of a combustible, like a piece of paper, a little piece of wood inside their envelope. The idea behind that is that as that's coming up to its austenizing temperature, uh, that wood is gonna burn off at a much cooler temperature, consume the oxygen so that you're left with an oxygen-free envelope by the time you get way up to those high temperatures around 2,000 degrees. That's the idea. Now, I've tried about 20 different blades using paper. What I've found, my experience has been that it causes my envelopes to puff up a few times it's actually puffed up so much that it uh, broke the seal, like where I was crimping or just caused a little stress fracture. And all of a sudden that's a whole moot point. I've got oxygen that can get in there. It can decarburize my steel. And then another time, actually my envelope puffed up so much. This is one of the very first times I did it. And I had it sitting in my even heat kiln. I had my little ceramic rods there and actually busted my rods and I was like, ah. So I have since then omitted the step of putting any type of a combustible in there. What I do now instead is that as I'm folding up my pouch, before I fold the very last corner over, I try and squish as much air out as I can and then I fold it. Now, once I'm at the austenizing temperature, 1950 degrees, obviously there is going to be some uh, how much? I don't know for sure, but there is going to be some decarburization. But again, with a limited amount of air in there, a limited amount of oxygen in there, once it's done eating away at that steel, there's no more oxygen, it's going to stop, right? So I've had really good success with not putting anything in there and just squishing out my envelope super duper tight. What that also does is it creates like a little vacuum. It kind of sucks itself onto it uh, once that oxygen's gone. Uh, think of the same way, I don't know if you're a kid, you ever did a science experiment where you have like a little candle in a jar and then you put your hand over it, once the oxygen's gone, the flame goes out, but it creates a little vacuum and it kind of sucks your hand in, right? The same thing happens in the envelope. Once there's no oxygen there, it kind of sucks itself in. I don't know why that didn't happen. When I use paper, I get the opposite. I'm not sure what I was doing, but like I said, I've done about 20 blades with a paper and over half of them puffed up. And so I'm just like, I can't figure this stuff out. I'm leaving it alone. So I don't do paper in mine, but 
That is one of the first uh, big differences uh, between the carbon steels and the stainless steels is that decarburization happens and we need to mitigate it somehow. Now there are some knife makers, I've seen some guys that I wouldn't say don't, well yeah, I don't necessarily really respect their work and it's terrible to say, but a lot of the stuff they do, the reason behind it from what I've learned and what I've understand and, and developed, I don't want to say it, but they're not doing it right. Uh, I've seen guys that will do like a bunch of carbon blades and then stainless blades and they'll get to 1500, they'll do their oil quench on their carbon blades and then just ramp up to 2000 degrees for their stainless blades and then quench them there. But those stainless blades aren't in an envelope. So now they're introducing fresh oxygen every time they open it and close it. You know, they pull one blade out, do this and then pull another. I really don't care what anybody says. They are going to get some decarburization. Now, I have also seen some knife makers that I really do respect uh, not do foil wraps at all. And I guess the question is that how much decarburization is happening, right? Like, I can't measure that. Uh, we could get scientists involved and, and measure that stuff. But my thought process behind it is that maybe it's fine. Maybe you really don't need a pouch. I think you do. I can't prove one way or another that you know, you've lost X amount, this percentage of your carbon has been burnt up, 100% guaranteed. I can't do that. But my thought process is this. We buy this steel and we pay more money for higher carbon content. Like we pay good money for this steel and it's the carbon and those different elements that we really want in the steel. That's what we're paying for. So why would we skip a step in our heat treat and sacrifice that performance that we're paying all kinds of money for just because we were lazy and didn't want to put it in an envelope. Now making envelopes is my least favorite part of working with stainless steels. I hate it. I'm actually going to try one process here soon and that is I've heard of guys taking a piece of wood. They'll put a block of wood in their kiln as it's heating up and I mean they're not airtight those kilns but the idea being maybe you could burn off enough oxygen. It's not gonna really make a big difference. I don't know, and I'm going to actually try some of these other steels, some 440C, doing it that way. But ultimately, I think the thing that you need to think about, again, I'm not saying this is boom, this is law, this is how it is, but decarburization exists. You know, you think about your welder. If you've got a MIG welder, uh, you know, the proper, not flex core, but actually gas shielded MIG welder, uh, that gas shielding, it's using argon, or I think mine uses carbon dioxide, carbon, I don't know what it is, but it's not argon. But anyways, you're blowing, you're purging that weld area and getting rid of the oxygen so that that liquid metal can cool up properly without being eaten away and destroyed by the oxygen. Now, obviously a welding temperature is significantly higher than an oxidizing temperature for these steels, but it's the same principle. Now, when you're talking about uh, commercial heat treat setups, some of the bigger companies, they'll actually have furnaces that they can control. They'll run a shielding gas in them so they can create an inert environment that way. But it is something that happens. It is something you need to consider and know about. And ultimately, if you want the best performance from a stainless steel, you need to control the environment that it is austenizing at. And I think that's about that. Now with our stainless steels, we're around 2000 degrees, 1950, whatever. We're austenizing, we're getting those carbides and all the good stuff to really pop, right? We're bringing out the true character of the steel that we want. Now we got to cool it down very rapidly. Now typically stainless steels are plate quenched. I'll take you over in a minute and I'll show you a close up of my plate quench. I've actually got a video of how I built that. Maybe we'll put that up in a corner here somewhere. Uh, but basically I'll take this knife there and then I put it between the two plates and I squish it down. Now aluminum is an incredible conductor of heat. That's why heat sinks and electronics are all made of aluminum because it can dissipate heat far better than steel. A lot of people have asked, could I just use steel blocks to do a, a plate quenching setup like this? And I honestly, say no I don't think so because steel does not move heat nearly as fast as aluminum does. The other thing with stainless steel some people have tried and uh, some people say that you can do some oil quenching and I haven't tried enough to say one way or the other but my thoughts are this when I kind of think about a little bit of theory behind it if I take a piece of steel that's 2000 degrees Fahrenheit and put that in oil, instantly it's boiling, right? You're, you're boiling all the oil, water, whatever it is around that blade. Well, when you're boiling it, you're creating air pockets around it and air is not a great conductor of electricity. You're not removing heat from all those air bubbles around it. Those air bubbles are keeping it from the oil, which would suck out the heat better. So my idea is that I think one of the fastest ways to quench is with a plate quench. And I've actually been experimenting uh, just using O1 tool steel and plate quenching it. And it's turning out fairly well. Now, when I put a knife in my vise and it's like 2000 degrees, uh, put it in there, clamp it down, compressed air. Within about 60 seconds, it's cool to the touch. So it is a very quick cooling process, like super fast. And it works absolutely fantastic. So that's another area 
that kind of is different with the stainless steels as opposed to the high carbon steels. And again, the reason people start with high carbon steels is because they're relatively easy. It's a lot easier to just get a bucket of oil, canola oil, vegetable oil, whatever, and use that for quenching than it is to go and find some aluminum plates and make some type of setup like this. A lot of guys will just hold the plates down, blow compressed air. Some of the stainless steels actually just air harden really well. So you'll just have to take them. A lot of guys just hold them up in the open air, blow compressed air around them, and they cool off very quickly and they harden up just fine that way. And again, every different steel benefits slightly different and acts different to different ways of quenching. So that kind of brings us to the state where we've gone to austenite and then back down to martensite. Now, a lot of stainless steels really benefit from a cryogenic treatment. And this is where you can kind of get into a whole can of worms. Cryogenic treatment. What's a cold treatment? What's a cryo treatment? The shallow cryo, a deep cryo? There's a lot of different schools of thought on this. And actually, a gentleman in uh, Tyndall Knives on Instagram, I'll put a link to his Instagram below. Uh, I put a picture on Instagram. <laughs> I said, remember kids, cryo isn't, or dry ice isn't cryo. And <laughs> he took offense to that. And we had a very good, respectable, heated dialogue. That was Instagram. I better shut that off. We had a very uh, good heated debate back and forth and he tried to convince me of his side. I tried to convince him of my side. I don't think either of us ended up jumping to the other side, but I definitely have a, it opened my eyes a lot to what you can do with dry ice. So, you know, there's the, the debate, okay, do you need liquid nitrogen or you can use dry ice in some type of a solution? And I have messed a little bit with dry ice, but I find that my dry ice didn't last very long. And then you've got this mess to deal with afterwards. Uh, I thought, you know what, if I'm going to do stainless, I want to do it the very best that I can. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be universally accepted that no matter what you do with dry ice, you will never achieve the temperatures, the cold temperatures of liquid nitrogen. Uh, dry ice, I don't really remember off the top of my head. It's like minus 120, minus 98 or something. I don't know for sure. Look it up. Uh, liquid nitrogen is around minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, certain chemicals like acetone or kerosene people will put in with their dry ice to create a solution. You can get colder than the temperature of the actual dry ice itself. And so there are ways to get really good cold treatment with dry ice. Now, if you look what the scientific terminology is about a deep cryogenic treatment, I don't know that you can reach those temperatures because I think they consider deep cryogenic to be around minus 220 Fahrenheit. I don't know if you could quite get there, but I think pretty much everybody accepts the fact that liquid nitrogen is colder than you can get dry ice and a solution. I use liquid nitrogen just because of the fact that it's clean, it's easy, but it's expensive. Uh, the Dewar that I purchased, let me go grab it for you. So this is a Dewar, Dewar, I don't know, I think it's Dewar, not Dewa, I don't know. But this is a 10 liter Dewar. Now this one here is from Praxair and this cost me $1,000 Canadian. That's expensive. Talking to some other knife makers, I've talked to some people that have bought cheap ones on eBay and they say that they don't last that long and after a year or two, they ended up upgrading to a really good high quality one, but you pay for it. I mean, I've seen uh, 20 liter Dewars on, on eBay. I don't even know if I say that right, Dewar, Dewar, whatever. I've seen them for like three, four, 400 bucks. A lot of guys say that you, unless you actually get them tested to make sure it's got its proper vacuum seal insulation, whatever, it's fairly risky to purchase. So I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna go ahead and buy a good one that is known, that has a warranty. And this is a company that fills this thing up. So they inspect it every time, they check it out, they make sure it's working properly. And uh, yeah, 10 liter doer. This thing cost me $148 Canadian to fill up with 10 liters of liquid nitrogen. The manufacturer, they told me when I bought this that your boil off rate is about half a liter per day. When I first heard that, I was like, holy moly. So what I would do is I would line up a whole bunch of stainless steel knives and then get them all ready to the point where they all were ready for heat treat. Then I would get this thing filled and that way I could be using this like nonstop pretty much saying, I don't wanna lose this stuff. I wanna get like two days worth of heat treating and get 10 or 20 blades done in that time. What I have found is that in the winter time, I actually was able to keep Keep liquid nitrogen here for two and a half months but now that it's summer and uh, I mean in the winter time the average air temperature outside was like minus 20 minus 25 is very cold but two and a half months I kept liquid nitrogen in here uh, now that it's summertime we're up in around 30 degrees 25 to 30 which is pushing down the like 90s to 100 Fahrenheit uh, it really only lasts about a month and a half and uh, maybe like within a month I'm down to a level like this and so you're pretty much just treating small blades. It is an expensive part of the process. It's very fun. This is uh, the stainless foil wraps were like my least favorite part of the stainless uh, working heat treating stainless. These are the most fun because it's cool. When you put it in there, it boils out and then you pull it up and it's frosty. I've got this time lapse of these things warming up to room temperature and man, it is so fun. It's like when it's kind of like mad science in the knife shop.
So that's the duar, that's my liquid nitrogen. And typically what I will do is I'll plate quench. So we've gone to the hardening, we've quenched it, and now that blade is super, super hard. And usually what I will do with a CPM 154 uh, is I will actually go straight into the liquid once it's come to room temperature, right? I mean, once it's cooled to room temperature, I'm not gonna go for my plate quench into there. I usually let it sit for about an hour and kind of cool off a bit. Then I'll leave it in liquid nitrogen. And usually I like to let it sit there for about 12 hours at least. So typically at the end of the day, I'll throw some knives in there, come back, take them out in the morning, and we've given it a deep cryogenic treatment. Now, now again, you need to be careful. These knives are super fragile, hard as can be when they're that cold and brittle as all get out. So what I'll do is I'll let them warm up in the air. And again, I'll bring them till they're about room temperature, leave them for an hour or two to warm up nicely. And once that's done, then I'll go on to my tampering processes. And uh, the tampering is actually fairly similar in temperatures to the carbon seals. You know, you can do the 400 degrees for two hours per cycle or one hour per cycle. It all varies, it all depends. Um, depends on what you want. If you're doing a kitchen knife, you're gonna wanna leave it a little harder because it's not gonna be subjected to a lot of uh, brute forces and stuff like that. But if you're doing a hunting knife, uh, you wanna soften it up a little bit more in your temper cycles so that it can stand some of the, you know, batoning wood or something like that. So, now there are some stainless steels that you don't need to do a cryogenic treatment on. Nitro-V is one of them that's touted to be, you know, it definitely benefits from cryo, but it's not necessary. And I have done a few blades in Nitro-V without cryogenic treatment, and they turned out phenomenally well. They held an edge really good, and you can get that on some of these stainless steels, even without cryogenic cryogenic treatment. Now I've also been doing a lot of reading and research that carbon steels, high carbon steels like O1 and stuff like that can actually really benefit from a cryogenic treatment. And I do believe that every single steel would benefit from cryo. I've started to do cryo on all of my O1 tool steel and I can notice a significant increase in wear resistance. And purely from a hands-on perspective, you know, you finish a blade off, you temper it out and all this stuff, and then you hand sand it to get the nice satin on there. I took two knives, exact same knives. One I did cryo on, one I did not do cryo. Exact same heat treat, same temper, everything and I was going to put my satin finish on. And the hand sanding of the one that had the cryo treatment was so much more difficult. It took about three times as long and it was just way more work. And I was like, they're absolutely onto something when they say that the wear resistance is significantly improved with cryogenic treatment. So that's kind of why I do that. I think the biggest reason that I cryo treat my O1 now is purely for wear resistance. Obviously it would make it hard, right? It'd make it harder, but we're gonna temper that out anyways because we've already got too much hardness. When you when you quench a knife, it's already too hard. You need to make it a little bit softer so it's more usable without being so fragile. And so that's not the reason for cryo with my high carbon steels. I just love how much better uh, wear resistance it has. And I think I can notice a difference in stain resistance as well. So there we have kind of the basic broad scope look at what's involved with heat treating stainless steels. And a lot of these areas can cross over. You know, there's some steels that are not necessarily fully considered a stainless steel but they have a lot of same characteristics and you know, there's a high carbon. It's just, there's so many different steels out there. One of the best things you can do is go to the manufacturer's website and get their heat treat recipes, their recommendations. And again, different knives get different heat treats for different purposes at all. There's so much to it. I mean, we could talk about this stuff for hours and hours and hours and still hardly get through it. But I hope guys, I hope that this has helped you out just to let you know. Uh, let's do a quick recap. So, Carbon seals, 1500 degrees, thereabouts. Liquid quench, typically oil, whatever. Stainless seals, 2000 degrees, typically plate quench, something like that, air quench, whatever. And then a lot of these need the cryo. These ones benefit from the cryo. Not necessary, but they do benefit. Uh, a lot of these do need it, but some of them actually don't. Ultimately, there's a lot of ways to get a really great knife. And I think if you were just doing your due diligence to say, you know what, I'm gonna do the very best I can with what I have to make as good of a heat treated knife as possible. That is the most important thing and the best thing you can do for your knife making. Thanks for watching this video, guys. I hope some of it made sense. I hope it wasn't just too much ramble damble. Let me show you my plate quench real quick. So here we have it. This was a cheap, this was the cheapest woodworking vise I could get my hands on. And then I've got one inch Plates, uh, actually gentleman on Instagram asked, okay, so they're uh, 12 inches long. So essentially I could quench a 12 inch blade in here and like you've kind of seen in the videos that I've inserted, pull it out of there, put it into here, clamp it down. And the one thing I do like about this style of a plate quench is that you can keep pressure on there and I think that would aid with warping. It's not gonna warp so bad. So that's what I did. All I did was I drilled and tapped these plates, bolted these through, have it, uh, oh, don't look at that. 
What on earth was I thinking? Anyways, I've just got it mounted to the side of my kiln so that it's really, it's a very smooth process. Boom, boom, and I'm done. And there you see that little thing that busted off from my pouch. So that is that. And then I'm gonna give you one more little tidbit of information. So Nitro V has been my nemesis and I love the steel, but when I'm working with longer blades, I get warpage like crazy. Uh, Mike with Ecom Knives had given me some awesome suggestions and what he does is he actually clamps the blade to a big chunk of aluminum and puts it into his dry ice and he said that he was actually talking to the New Jersey Steel Baron and they say that you do not need uh, to liquid nitrogen Nitro V. Let me see with my own eyes, that's straight as can be. And so I've been using the liquid nitrogen. A lot of people are wondering if that's where my warp was coming in, out of liquid nitrogen, straight as an arrow. So what I did this time is I just took these two plates here, I clamped it down and then I tempered it in between these two steel plates and it did a two hour temper cycle. And this is the first Nitro V blade of this size I've had come out this straight. Oh, that makes me excited. All right, that's pretty much it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, guys. Again, I would love to hear your thoughts. If you've got other ideas about heat treating, uh, little tips and techniques that you have, if you have questions, I'll do my best to answer these. Uh, maybe in another couple months, we'll get a follow-up video. Maybe we'll need another follow-up video if I learn new things. But my goal with this is just to teach you what I have learned, what I have found out. It's it's the best that I've got right now. I'm really impressed. It's It's been a significant improvement from where I started. That's why the first time I did stainless steel, I didn't do videos on like, here's how I do my stainless steel because I didn't have it figured out yet. Uh, it's always getting better. Every knife is better than the last one and it's so much fun. I hope you're having fun with it. Thank you so much for watching. Cheers. Oh, I've also got Clown Donkey shirts available.